Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, send us a tweet on Twitter to at The Organic View, or you can contact me directly at June Stoyer. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. On today's show, we're going to be talking about the efforts to ban neonicotinoids in Canada. On Monday, April 29, 2013, the European Union approved the decision to push forward the ban on three neonicotinoid pesticides across the entire continent. Although, in the United States, the EPA does not recognize the fact that there is adequate science to substantiate a ban, much less restrict the use of neonicotinoids. However, in Canada, the Ontario beekeepers are calling for the suspension of neonicotinoid pesticides. In this special series called The Neonicotinoid View, my guest co-host Tom Theobald and I will be joined by the Vice President of the Ontario Beekeepers Association, Mr. Tibor Sabo, who will discuss the efforts to ban neonicotinoids in Canada. So I would first like to welcome to the show Mr. Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Hello, June. And our guest today, Mr. Tibor Sabo, the Vice President of the Ontario Beekeepers Association. Good afternoon, Tibor. Good afternoon, June, and good afternoon, Tom. Hi, Tibor. It's good to talk to you again. Tibor, can you share with our audience about yourself and also your experience as a beekeeper? Well, June, um, I'm a third-generation beekeeper. Um, I'm a queen producer in Canada. We do about 5,000 queens in the month of June. It's a short season here. Uh, we also produce hives and nucleus colonies for sale to other beekeepers. I've been in business since 1996. My father was a a research scientist with Agriculture Canada. He specialized in breeding honeybees. And I learned from my father uh, my beekeeping techniques. And that's what's what we do here in Canada. <laughs> Tibor, uh, here in the United States, the lead regulatory agency is the Environmental Protection Agency. And, and you have a similar agency in Canada. Could you just explain for the listeners what their responsibilities are and how they relate to the American EPA and and what their name is. In Canada, the uh, agency that's responsible for uh, regulating agricultural chemicals is called the PMRA or Pest Management and Regulatory Agency. And they would do what the EPA would do in the States. So they would be the same type of regulatory agency. And they work uh, with the EPA as well. They, they share a lot of uh, data and uh, similar products for registration. They work together quite a bit. Thank you. Tibor, can you comment on the EPA's Honeybee Health press conference that took place on May 2nd, 2013, in which the EPA attributes the global decline to the following items, parasitic mite, especially varroa, multiple viruses, bacteria, poor nutrition, genetic diversity of bees, loss of bee habitat, and other pesticides. Yes, I certainly will, June. The different factors that were cited as responsible for bee decline, the first one they listed was the uh, varroa mite or parasitic mite. They're referring to the varroa mite, which is an ectoparasite that uh, originates from the Asian honeybee, Apis serena, and it crossed species. Uh, the history on it is, is not exactly clear, but we know that it was uh, on our European honeybees, which is Apis mellifera, that dates back to about the 1950s. So beekeepers have been dealing with varroa mite since about the 1950s. We first got the varroa in Canada in about the early 1990s, about 1990, 1991, it entered Ontario. Uh, the United States first got it in 1987. Uh, there are other uh, mites that affect bees, and particularly to honeybees, there's a tracheal mite. It's indigenous to the honeybee, and our honeybees have evolved with that mite for millions of years. And it's not really something that beekeepers pay a lot of attention to nowadays because healthy bee management is, um, is, is one of the best controls for it. The other factors that they touched on was viruses, bacteria, poor nutrition, genetics, habitat loss, and pesticides. So um, all the other factors could be related to the, what they listed last as pesticides. There is a difference between the pathology 
of uh, parasitic mite syndrome, which is also called varroatosis, and the pathology of chronic poisoning, which you would get from bees picking up uh, insecticides in pollen and nectar or water. And so once a person has experience with either of these problems with bees, they, they can recognize it just from visual symptoms. Now, beekeepers have quite a bit of experience dealing with, obviously, the varroa mite, uh, because we've had it for uh, at least 20-some years. And some people have had it for longer than that. The uh, the more newer problems that uh, people have been noticing in the past four years, at least, at least in Ontario, uh, the province that I keep these in, and longer in the States, is the chronic poisoning of the colonies. And the chronic poisoning will affect, and, and the whole system that the bees live in are, are, is affected by uh, systemic insecticides. The neonicotinoids are classified as systemic insecticides because they enter the plant, uh, they become part of the plant, the plant becomes poisonous to the pests that are trying to eat it and anything else that's trying to eat it, if it's an insect, for sure. Uh, so they're classified as systemic insecticides, but they're also systemic in the environment because they have a very long period of existence in the environment before they break down. The products, or what's called the metabolites that they break down into, are also toxic to bees. So uh, they're highly water-soluble. They move in the environment through the water and even through the air at the time of planting. So they're, they're truly a environmentally systemic pesticide. And that being the case, they could affect the nutrition of bees. They could affect the disease counts in the bees by affecting the, um, the bees' immune system. They could certainly affect habitat loss, uh, things like that. Um, for instance, if, um, if you have... Uh, it, well, one easy thing that could happen right across North America to really improve habitat for bees is to stop a roadside spraying of, of herbicides wherever that exists. Some some places, uh, counties do it, and some places they don't, but uh, there's an awful lot of roadside, and that could all be blooming plants, sweet clover and uh, different varieties of clover, and depending on where you live, different different kinds of flowering plants, which the bees would most certainly visit and, and benefit a great deal from, and, and become productive land as well for um, for, for beekeepers. Uh, it would also have a positive effect on the native pollinators. However, if those um, areas are contaminated with ditch water that's running off of fields uh, and, and it has a, a systemic pesticide in it, those plants will take up that pesticide and then um, attracting bees to a toxic dinner is not a good idea. So habitat loss could mean that the habitat doesn't exist to begin with or it could mean that the habitat has become poisonous to the bees. As far as uh, viruses, bacteria, well, all organisms face pressure from things like viruses and bacteria and other other microorganisms. Or with bees, bees are bees are no different. They have an immune system to defend themselves against these. Uh, a normally healthy colony has a, a great ability to defend itself against uh, most of these uh, pests. Um, there's a traditional um, bacteria that's extremely bad for bees called American fowl brood. It's highly contagious and, and beekeepers have to work diligently to make sure that it never enters their uh, their beekeeping operation and if it does then they, they will look after it. And in Ontario we have a bee inspection program where the hives are inspected and specifically for this particular bacteria disease. It's a disease of the brood and, um, and, and in fact it was already identified before people even identified what a bacteria was and it was called the pestilence of the hive back in 1880 when Langstroth first invented our, the beehives that we keep. Um, and then when um, antibiotics became available, they can, they, they actually um, they don't really control it because it's a spore-forming bacteria and the spores can survive in, or, or stay in honey for years and they sprout in the gut of the young um, larval bees. However, um, it does a good job of, uh, of um, clearing it out of the colony for a period of time, but uh, beekeeping techniques can manage uh, American fowl brood. Uh, viruses are well, they're mainly an issue when bees are already stressed. For instance, if you have a high mite level of varroa mites, the bees then become susceptible to something called a deformed wing virus. Their, their blood or hymolymph is um, basically uh, removed by the mites through they're like blood-sucking mites is what they are for a bee. And these, uh, these bees that are developed with, um, under these conditions don't have the same strength or ability as a healthy bee, obviously, 
and they be, they become more susceptible to certain viruses. So management of your varroa mites, whether management techniques or using young queens or drone brood removal or mite control product is really important. Your bees don't um, pick up the viruses, but the mites themselves are enough of a reason to uh, pay a lot of attention to that. But uh, the poor nutrition, that's another um, another one of the factors that was identified by EPA. Uh, poor nutrition, it could be uh, a cause of the bees being affected by pesticide as well. If they're, if, they're, if they're sick bees or you're losing your foraging population, nothing is making it back uh, to the hive with new resources. Well, the nutritional level in your hive is obviously going to drop. Uh, if the uh, pollen or nectar that's being gathered, and uh, when we talk about nutrition for bees, bees it's really concentrate on the pollen. The, um, the pollen is their protein and nutrition. Uh, the, the honey is their carbohydrate source. If there's um, insecticide in the pollen, that will most definitely identify that as a poor, uh, poor nutrition, a poor nutrition that's going to give you a poisoning. So it, it's actually related to the pesticide as well. Uh, genetics, with the, with the EPA trying to identify genetics as a reason for bee loss, uh, I'm not really sure where they were going with that one. Uh, bee breeders keep a close eye on, on genetics that, of the bees they're breeding, and I'm speaking from personal experience. Bees that have uh, diverse genetics have a solid brood pattern, which means when the queen lays eggs, she lays many eggs that are successful and grow on to the pupa stage and at the pupa stage they put up a wax cap on the top of the larva and it'll become it'll start its pupa stage and when you have a solid pattern of these of these wax caps it's called a solid brood pattern and that's a, a, a sign of a first off a healthy hive it's also a sign of, of of no inbreeding when a queen mates she mates with about 15 to 20 drones at five to six days old uh, between the hours of about 11 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon. It has to be about 20 degrees Celsius and sunny for the mating flight to occur. If she mates um, with drones that are closely related to her, then when she lays eggs later on in her life, she will lay some eggs that will actually become what's called a diploid, diploid drone. Uh, the eggs that are fertilized, usually fertilized eggs produce a female bee and the unfertilized eggs produce a male bee or the drones. And if the drones she mates with are closely related to her, then the, some of the eggs that she lays that have been fertilized with the sperm from the closely related drones, those will actually be a male fertilized egg, and the bees in the nest will eat that right away. And what you end up with is a spotty brood pattern because not all of the eggs turned out, and so they have empty spots because the bees never raise that into a, a, an adult. Yeah, here in the United States, we refer to that as shotgun brood. Shotgun brood. So it is a sign of, of uh, inbreeding. However, in, with inbreeding in bees, to prevent it, all you need is about a 5% influx of new genetics into your bee stock every year to prevent inbreeding. And bees are traded internationally. And before the wild bees died off in the 90s in Canada and, and different times throughout the world, as Varroa entered the picture and spread around the planet, the wild bees would mate, the drones would mate with the bees that beekeepers kept, and the bees that beekeepers kept would swarm and become wild bees. The two populations between wild bees and kept bees weren't really, they really weren't that different except where one colony lived as opposed to another. Uh, the hives that we keep bees in, they're not really there for the bees so much they're there for the beekeeper so he can manage the bees they're more of a harness than a house where bees can live in just about any kind of cavity of a particular size or dimension that they look for when, we, when we're talking about varroa it can affect the brood pattern pesticides can affect the brood pattern inbreeding can affect the brood pattern so when you how to to single that out as inbreeding alone um, and how you would determine whether it's inbreeding, I, I'm not just really don't know. And speaking from a queen producer perspective, where breeding is part of my work, I'm not really sure where they were going with that one. Tibor, if I could just step in here for a minute, um, I also listen to the uh, the program 
the presentation by the EPA yesterday, and I've talked to a number of beekeepers since, and the general consensus seems to be that uh, the EPA and the EPA scientists uh, are looking to the science not for answers, but for excuses, and they say there's no smoking gun, and I think you've made it pretty clear that a lot of these common challenges to a colony of bees are exacerbated by the effect of the neonicotinoids. They say there's no smoking gun. One beekeeper told me that they wouldn't recognize a smoking gun if you stuck it in their ear. Um, I had a number of questions, most of which you've answered beautifully, but there's one more that I would like to ask, and that has to do with statements being made by the chemical industry. For quite some time, they've used Australia as an example of no problem. Lots of neonicotinoids, no problem with the bees. And in our conversations with Australian beekeepers, that just simply is not the case. Now, more recently, I read an article where they're making the same claim about Canada. No problem in Canada, no bee losses, lots of neonicotinoids, they're not losing any bees. Could you comment on your experience with that in that regard? Well, there certainly is a problem, and it's been identified uh, by testing that the government did on dead bees, that uh, we have an issue with bees dying from clothianidin and thymothoxin were both found on dead bees in the province of Ontario and Quebec. So there most definitely is a problem. We've been, uh, beekeepers have been noticing uh, poisoning symptoms and dead bees at the time of planting of crops, of farmers' crops, uh, at least for the past four years. Last year was a very dramatic episode where thousands of colonies across the province were all affected over a, over the planting season, which lasted about uh, maybe three, three and a half weeks, depending on where you live in the province. And then throughout the summer, uh, more and more hives were showing uh, a poisoning symptoms of the brood and a decline in the population. And, and beekeepers in this province are very good at managing mite levels. They've, uh, they've, they've dealt with them for uh, more than 20 years, and, 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 and they monitor the populations of these things. So um, they're well aware of the, the pathology difference between varroatosis, which is the mite disease, and, and poisoning symptoms. And it's the poisoning symptoms that uh, management techniques cannot do anything about. I mean, what we've been doing is we, when we identify a, poisoning, a poisoned hive, we, we shake the bees off the comb, to join another hive and, and we burn the comb because we found using that comb on another hive even a year later will make that other hive show the same poisoning symptoms so we, we, the bees are, are telling us that there's um, whatever's on that or whatever made the bees sick some of it is still occurring on the comb that they were living on so it's too risky to reuse it now so, if you've lost the hive and you have to replace the equipment. Can you just give the listeners an idea of what the cost of that is for an average beekeeper? Well, it depends on where you live. The cost of bees in Canada is, is higher than in the United States. We have a shorter season. A colony of bees in Canada, a single brood chamber colony, which would be a one-box beehive, uh, is anywhere from the $250 to $300 a hive range. Now, that's uh, the cost of the bees in the hive and the equipment. However, if you lose your bees, you don't only lose your hive, you lose the production of that hive. So if you're in the pollination business, you may have uh, two or three pollination contracts. You might, you might have another $250 worth of pollination contracts, maybe $150, depending on, on the beekeeper. Some have uh, them rented out to more crops than others. So it starts with... Uh, uh, cherries in the spring, sweet and sour cherries. It can be apples and pears and, and any of the fruit bloom in the spring. And then the, we have summer, early summer pollination of blueberries. Thousands of bees go to, to blueberry pollination and cranberries for some people. And some people have uh, canola in the summer, cucumbers. So some beekeepers can catch a few different contracts and make their make their living uh, renting their bees. And then those bees also make make honey and, um, and either you retail it or, or you wholesale it. But it uh, the, the cost of production of a hive, it can vary according to beekeeper. Uh, if you're a queen producer, a, a hive can, a, a hive producing queen cells, uh, if you can make thousands of dollars from one beehive. And if you, if, if you lose that beehive, you've lost the potential for uh, a lot of income. So 
it depends on the intensity of beekeeping the beekeeper is doing, but you've you've got basically the cost of the beehive, which is two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars. The loss of production, which you could maybe average at uh, four to five hundred dollars per hive. So really, the the loss to the beekeeper in one year is around eight hundred dollars, and this is what we've determined in in Ontario as a as a number to uh, to go with with the with the with the pesticide loss. Oh. Tibor, can you explain to our audience what the process is for getting the neonicotinoids banned in Canada? From what I can see, it's up to the regulation or the regulators to look at uh, all the mountain of evidence that keeps coming in, and, and just the fact that there's really no evidence uh, showing that they're safe right from the right from the beginning of registration. Um, nobody really has an explanation on why they were conditionally registered to begin with when it was entirely lacking uh, data on uh, on its any any possible safety towards bees it was entirely lacking and still is uh, it, it's a bit of insulting to the bee industry that a chemical that's uh, that it only takes um, four billionths of a gram and I'm talking billionth to be acutely toxic to a honeybee and so put that into perspective one gram of clothianidin which is about the size of a a little packet of salt that you get at uh, at a restaurant or, or a fast food place. Those little salt packets, a little that's approximately a gram. So a, a one gram of clothianidin has enough poison to kill 25 metric tons of honeybees. Uh, that there's over 2,200 pounds in a metric ton. So you do the math. It's quite scary when every single field, agricultural field is treated with this stuff whether it needs it or not and most of them don't need it. Uh, in fact studies have shown um, soybean production is actually higher with healthy beehives near it because they get better pollination on uh, on their flowers than if the bees aren't there and um, and, and they really they really don't need the insecticide. A lot of uh, corn varieties are already genetically modified to have a bacillus gene or a bacteria gene that is poisonous to anything in the Lepidoptera order or any um, a butterfly moth pests that might be eating them, so they're already um, covered with uh, insecticide for, for for a good part of what uh, what affects the uh, the crop, and and so it, it's a just in case. Um, it's like the entire continent um, consuming antibiotics every day, just in case somebody's going to get sick one day in the in the season, which obviously has got some really bad ideas to that idea, but uh, that's what's basically going on in agriculture. I did some quick calculation while you were talking, Tibor, and there are 3,500 bees to the pound, so that means 7 billion bees to a ton. And, and how many tons were you talking about? Yeah, it's, it's about um, 250 million bees, uh, and it's a metric ton we're talking about. So one gram of clothianidin can kill 250 million bees. So that's 25 metric tons. Tibor, can you just share with our audience, for people that really can't fathom that type of situation, take it to a more personal level. Can you explain to the listeners how even the pollen that is just blowing around can actually impact them as individuals, as well as their families? Well, I'm, I'm, I really... Um... I, I can't say I'm an expert on, on how it'll affect individuals or families. I just I see it poisoning my bees, and I can certainly give you um, insight into into that. Poison blowing around is not a good idea for anything. It can land on uh, flowers that my bees are going to. It can land on water that my bees are drinking from or other wildlife. It can land on uh, on, on on my my children's toys. If there's toys lying around in the yard, I live in the country, and you know it, there's really uh, it can land anywhere. I don't really. Uh, it's not a safe scenario. The, the machines that plant seeds were never designed for uh, chemical applications. So we have an issue where now they're all of a sudden uh, being used to apply this extremely, extremely potent insecticide that's very persistent and, and water soluble that has basically systemically enters the environment. During the, the time of application, it's blowing around where, wherever the wind decides to blow it. And then for the rest of the year, it's leaching through the water wherever the water decides to go. So eventually it ends up in drinking water, apparently. In Long Island, New York, they found it up to 407 parts per billion in tap water. 
Uh, and when the lethal dose for bees is 3.68, according to PMRA, uh, parts per billion, 3.68 parts per billion, that, that would mean I, I couldn't use tap water from Long Island, New York to mix uh, feed for my bees or I would kill them. So that, that's a concern. I mean, it's it's we need to do something sooner rather than later because once it's in our drinking water, we can't keep bees if if it's everywhere, if it's in the water. We can't keep ourselves. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we're bigger than bees, so it's uh, it, it's going to hit the little guys first, right? Oh, of course, but the fact that it's cumulative and the damage that it causes is irreparable is really kind of scary to me. Yeah, well, I, I, I know that they cause health complications to my bees and the bees do not recover from uh, poisoning of new nicotinoids. I, I, um, we've been watching the, the, these hives that pick it up uh, decline now for at least four years. And uh, my father was the first one to notice it, and he said to me, um, we've got some bees that are being poisoned. And we didn't know the stuff was being used. We had no idea uh, that it was even being used. But apparently it, uh, in, the, in the past few years, it's become mainstream, and now it's, it's on every, almost every bit of seed that's sold to farmers, whether they want it or not. So um, the, the, uh, it used to be that in agriculture, at least... Uh, about 15 years ago, it was a it, there was a big push for integrated pest management, where we wanted to reduce the use of poisons unless we absolutely needed it, and use all other types of management techniques to uh, to produce crops or produce whatever we were trying to produce without relying on poisons. Because the fact there's a couple of reasons. First, it's not healthy to have a lot of poisons in in your environment or ecosystem or life support system. I mean, everybody knows that. Um, also, when you have broad scale use of, of something, of a tool, because it can be, they can be used as a tool in agriculture for sure. Um, and um, when you have a broad scale use, you have the problems of resistance from the, what you're trying to control building up. So there's, there's bad reasons for doing it um, right across the spectrum. But now it's uh, the, it seems like we've just disbanded all those good ideas to put on everything just in case a bug shows up that happens to want to eat something that you planted. It doesn't seem to be long-term thinking, uh, and it's certainly disastrous for the bee population. And I'm not just talking about the honeybee population, but uh, the native bees, they don't have beekeepers looking after them that have been very working very hard to keep increasing and, and keep their hives healthy and to shake out and burn the hives that have been affected and feed and grow and produce more queens for a new generation of healthy bees. That's what's been going on in the beekeeping industry. There's been uh, beekeepers and, and whole beekeeping businesses that have dedicated their whole business to producing bees, and myself is included in that uh, group. The whole process of accelerated bee production, which is the way that bees are replenished after there's been losses, it's negative for the traditional pests of bees like the varroa mite and, and a lot of these other issues. With brand new comb and, and new queens and good feed in a good environment, bees traditionally just grew fantastically. But now that there's these um, systemic poisons in the environment. There are hives that pick up these poisons and they do not grow. There's a certain point when they pick it up, they, they start to decline. And, and some beekeepers have called it shrinkage. It's a certain amount of shrinkage. Um, the hives basically shrink to nothing. And it's become part of doing business um, in the bee business. And it's not really acceptable because it's not going to, if people ignore it or try to confuse the issue with pretending it's other issues when they're all actually connected, because we're all part of a system, then it's just going to get worse. And it'll get to the point when, when it's in your groundwater at 407 parts per billion, you might as well forget keeping bees in, in that part of the uh, world uh, until it, uh, one day is gone. But uh, we need to really take it seriously before things get that far. I wanted to add uh, an experience that I had just recently that impressed upon me the gravity of this situation and the dangers of the posture that the regulatory agencies have taken and it was in the Central Valley of California. My friend Miles McGahey and I were out there to pick up a load of packages to bring back to Colorado 
and we passed mile after mile of rice fields that were being flooded at the time. And I recall that the Environmental Protection Agency in August of 2012 had approved the use of clothianidin as a seed treatment and foliar application for rice. And you have to remember, clothianidin is water soluble, migrates with the groundwater, accumulates with successive uses, is very persistent, and tiny, tiny amounts can have profound effects. And they elected to put it right into the water system. I don't know what their reasoning is. It just astounds me. Well, the bottom line is when it comes to the water, everyone depends upon water to live. And if it's in the water, which it is, that's really, really getting to become a critical situation for all forms of life. So on that note, Tibor, I wish you all the best in your efforts to get neonicotinoids banned in Canada. And I appreciate the time that you've taken today to share your knowledge and insight with our audience. You're welcome, June. And uh, thank you, Tom, for having me on again. And Tibor, can you also share with our audience your website? Yes, certainly. Um, Our website is www.honeybees.ca or Honeybees Canada. Thank you, Tibor. And folks, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.